my good luck charm. While Barbara exits, I will um, say, obviously, uh, my contract didn't hold because there were supposed to be mimosas and Bloody Marys on the tables <laughs> to kind of warm up this audience. But I'll talk to them after it's done. I don't get a redo. So it's kind of like, oh, man, this is bad. And all of you didn't take my advice to sleep in this morning, so I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about that. Good morning. Bonjour. What a pleasure it is to have I had Barbara Epstein introducing me today. I have known and been friends with Barbara for decades, literally decades. And one of the facts about the dough is that the previous dough lecturer introduces you. And throughout the year, any time I would talk to Barbara, she would say, be nice to me, because I have to introduce you. <laughs> so I must have done a good job, because that was a lovely introduction. So our first trip into the Wayback Machine. When I was in library school at the University of Pittsburgh, taking the health sciences bibliography course, yes, that's what it was called, Barbara was a relatively new librarian at Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic, better known as Western Psych. Many assignments took me there. And now, she was, she, at that time, she was the young librarian we all aspire to be. And now, she is the experienced library leader I still admire. She has been so gracious, encouraging, and supportive throughout this year just as she was when I first met her 35 years ago. Thank you again, Barbara. All too often, we wait until the end of a presentation to thank those who have been instrumental and supportive. Through readings, example, and feedback, these people have supported me with their generosity, intelligence, insights regarding leadership, and with their support for this lecture and throughout my entire career. And in particular, the last two people you see on this list have supported me with a tremendous amount of love. And one of them is in the audience today. So on the screen, you're seeing a rolling list of all those who helped me in some way on my Janet Doe journey. It takes a village to deliver a Janet Doe lecture, and I thank you all. The Medical Library Association has made me cry twice. <laughs> the first time was in 1997 when I received the Estelle Broadman Award for Academic Medical Librarian of the Year, and those were tears of joy and excitement. The second time I cried was when I learned I was to be the 2016 Janet Doe Lecturer. <laughs> the Janet Doe Lecturer for any given year is named more than a year in advance. Why, you ask? Well, this is in order to, pro to provide sufficient time to prepare the lecture and to build a level of panic as the date approaches. So those, indeed, were tears of pure terror. The Janet Doe Lecture has been delivered by luminaries and leaders in our field who have provided eloquent and elegant insights into our profession. They have served as inspirations and guideposts for our careers. And to look back on the list of lecturers and their lectures is a humbling experience. And to know that one's name is going to be added to that list may actually be the real reason I cried when I learned of the honor. And an honor it is. So, I think Nina Matheson may have said it best in her 1994 Doe Lecture when she said, every Doe Lecturer since has disclaimed professional qualifications for writing history or philosophy. All have written about what they hold nearest and dearest to their professional hearts, seeking to inform, to provide insight, to inspire, and even to entertain. So if you will indulge me, I would like to share some insights regarding my Doe journey. One of my inner medical librarianship demons is that I have always envied colleagues who have deep expertise in specific areas like teaching and learning, outreach, metadata management, uh, expert searching, anything like that, the people who go deep into their expertise. I, however, am a sampler, preferring to know a little bit about a lot and looking at things broadly. This perspective supports examining interrelationships, trends, wide areas of interest, looking for commonalities and relationships. It would probably make me a great Jeopardy contestant. A colleague once introduced me as being one of the most curious people she knows. I chose to interpret that as inquisitive. Others might interpret it as odd. <laughs> In reflection, this learning style suited my approach to this lecture. And now for some truths and confessions. So before we start our Drew Doe journey, I have some things to say. I never met Janet Doe or any other early MLA luminary founder. And although I have known many wonderful leaders, contemporary leaders, I never met any of those 
more experienced older people. I did once receive a very nice note from Estelle Broadman, and I believe I have had a supernatural encounter with Marsha Noyes. <laughs> more on that later. My second point is, I did not read all the previous Doe lectures. That has been alluded to in previous lectures as a tradition. Sorry, I hope this won't cause you to rush the stage and throw me out. However, I did read some pertinent ones. And the final truth is that when you start preparing the Doe lecture, you have grand ideas regarding how you're going to present the lecture and wow the audience. And as it gets closer and closer, those frills start to fall away. So in what I am sure will be another disappointment, there will be no shadow puppets. There will be no costume changes. There will be no holograms and, worst of all, no interpretive dance, as I had originally planned. This has been, there has been an interesting personal synchronicity um, to my developing my talk. This is the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the Janet Doe Lecture, but the first lecture was actually given in 1967 by Gertrude Annan, another luminary I never knew. This is my 30th MLA meeting. It's been 10 years since I had the honor of serving, of serving as MLA's president in what's fondly referred to as the Tui Reign of Terror. And on the day I began my six-week administrative assignment to do research for this lecture, thanks to the generosity of the leadership at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, David Bowie, one of my favorite artists and pop icons, died, which led me today to our title, We Can Be Heroes. You know, those of you who know David Bowie know that, that his hero song is, is one of my favorites. MLA's Leadership Journeys. So MLA's heroes are presidential leaders and our professional and personal leadership journeys are what we're going to examine today. Back to the title side. Let us begin our journey. Leadership and the qualities of leaders are of interest to me, as they have been to every culture, every society, every institution, every organization, and to most people. Joshua Rothman wrote in his February 29, 2016, New Yorker Critic at Large column, entitled, Shut Up and Sit Down, Why the Leadership Industry Rules, Luminaries as diverse as Plato, Confucius, and Machiavelli have thought about leadership and the qualities of leadership. He cites a Kinsey report that says American companies spend 14 billion, billion with a B, dollars annually on leadership training. The age-old questions of whether a leader is born or made, whether there are shared characteristics among leaders, and the qualities of great leaders tease our minds. Broadly researching leadership and leadership characteristics, and then examining these within the context of our own professional home, career, and our personal development offered great opportunities to me. Based on the readings and research, I found that this is also a topic of great interest to many in our library communities, as our association and profession strive to remain relevant and heard in the fast-paced information world in which we work and live. And it's not just about remaining relevant and heard, but leading as well. How do we grow and nurture new leaders? Are there things we can learn from our association past? 2016 seemed like a great year to reflect on this, with the cacophony of US elections all around us, bludgeoning us with evidence of lack of leadership. Respecting the intent of this lecture, intent of this lecture with its focus on history and perspective on our profession, the first step of our leadership journey today includes analysis of leadership traits of our past leader, he, leader heroes. Additionally, Surveying the past 25 years of MLA presidents, interviewing current MLA leaders and MLA executive directors helped to identify historical and evolutionary commonalities in our association's perception of leadership. The next leg in the lecture journey takes a brief look at how MLA has, is, and will be supporting leadership development. A brief review of the characteristics experts say will be necessary for our personal and professional survival and futures will be next. And finally, we're going to take time to reflect on our own ability to lead. By the time we reach the end of this Doe journey, we will know we all can be heroes. We'll be creating a mosaic of leadership journeys. In a frequently used quotation by the philosopher Lao Tzu, who was actually the father of serv servant leadership, the concept of servant leadership, he said that the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Please take a step and join me on these journeys this morning. In a seminal article by Harvard Business School professor John T <clears throat> Cotter entitled, What Leaders Really Do, published in the Harvard Business Review 
In 1990, he proposed leadership and management are different but complementary systems of action, as can be seen on this slide. In a changing world, they must coexist. His major point was that managers cope with complexity while leaders cope with change. Not all good managers are good leaders, and not all leaders are good managers. And that's appropriate and makes sense. The great Warren Bennis, who studied corporate leadership, and said that managers are people who do things right, and leaders are people who do the right things. While the buzzword of this lecture is leadership, we must acknowledge the relationship between leadership and management, and accept that some management traits will slip in, and that'll be OK. After all, we're talking about leading an association, our own organizations, and our personal leadership journeys, where a strong balance between management and leadership is needed. The title of Tom Basler's 2008 Janet Doe lecture was, There Are No More Giants, Changing Leadership for Changing Times. And one would be led to believe by that title that he was saying, there are no more leaders in our profession. Knowing Tom, and because he's probably psychic, this title was intentionally meant to provoke the 2016 Janet Doe lecturer. <laughs> his lecture is not available in the JMLA, but he kindly shared his slides with me. He did explore some of our more illustrious MLA forebearers and the amazing impact they had on the shaping of our profession. But his lecture moved into a comprehensive review of the foundation and growth of our profession and the impact of changes in our environment, thus saving himself from my future wrath. He told us the things we individually need to do to survive and thrive in these changing environments. He told us that we're in control of our destinies. Perhaps we shouldn't wait for giants to bail us out. Many of the terms and attributes he used, we'll hear, we will hear over and over again this morning. However, he did explore, he did not explore, contemplate the why behind MLA leadership. So why were our early leaders our leaders? How to look back at the past? How to discover the power and characteristics of our past leaders? We can't talk to them or feel their personal magnetism, although a few of them do have oral histories where you can hear their voices. And though it is tempting to develop a revisionist viewpoint of, through our modern lens, they weren't all wonderful, nor would we even recognize some of their names. As Rachel Anderson observed in her landmark 1989 Doe lecture, Reinventing the Medical Librarian, which is as fresh and relevant today as it was back then, our association forebears were confronted by gender bias and racism and reacted not always in a way of which we would be proud. Carolyn Lipscomb's two-part series of JMLA articles, Race and Librarianship, published in 2004 and 2005, are a must read. We expect our leaders to be embodiments of our better selves, and this may not always be the case. In the mid-20th century, MLA was a smaller professional organization. In 1940, there were 291 individual members and 147 institutional ones. These early leaders and heroes were great because they were establishing a profession and an association, an association we nurture today. And they knew of or knew each other. They knew strengths, they knew their weaknesses, they knew accomplishments. Their main form of communication was writing letters. The prevalent information technology was the typewriter. However, if nothing else, they had the skills, the vision, and as Michael Homan put it in his presidential inaugural address, a passion for the profession. They were doers. They assumed the mantle of responsibility and they adroitly combined leadership and management qualities. Did they exhibit leadership traits we might recognize from the Cotter article or today's leadership literature? And how to find out? So before we climb into the MLA leadership wayback machine and analyze our past leaders, I would like to share two side trips I took on my leadership exploration journey into our foundational past. As I mentioned, I enjoy scanning broadly and bringing disparate pieces together. And so every now and then, I would take a side trip. My side trips were a result of wondering just how I could find out more about our presidential leaders. And one story, as I said, involves a trip, and the other, a ghost. The trip occurred last November, when the MLA recognition plaque was unveiled on Chestnut Street in Philadelphia. It recognizes the founding of MLA in 1898 by physicians George M. Gold and Sir William Osler and Margaret R. Charlton, librarian. Although there were four physicians and four librarians in attendance, these three were the primary movers and shakers. 
Seeing the use of the word librarian was, I have to say, an emotional moment. It was a recognition that we were involved in the founding of a profession, our profession, and that it wasn't just founded by a group of male physicians wanting to share medical knowledge. Margaret Charlton, who was a Canadian, was an equal partner. We will never know specifically what was said, but we do know they were leaders and visionaries. Everyone should read at least one history of MLA to learn more about the details of our founding. In particular, Francis Groen's 1998 article written for our centennial, Three Who Made an Association, is an excellent focus on our three founders. Now, MLA remained a physician-led association until 1933. Does anyone know what happened then? Thank you. <laughs> That's true. One of the four founding librarians in Philadelphia, Marsha Crocker Noyes, was elected the first female non-physician president of MLA. And that is why our highest honor, the Marsha C. Noyes Award, is named for her. And while the dissemination of medical knowledge was one of the main reasons the Medical Library Association was founded, Marsha Noyes made it happen. And kind of in a parallel incident, isn't it interesting that the first non-physician female leader of the National Library of Medicine was announced last week. Marcia C. Noyes, yeah. and we probably should mention Carla Hayden as the first librarian of Congress, female, woman of color. Absolutely. So cool. Marcia C. Noyes was a remarkable, unobtrusive, and humble woman. And not only was she one of the four founding librarians, but she also edited the bulletin, founded and maintained the exchange for years, and participated in other critical activities to keep our young association going and growing. No task was too small or beneath her. And this is where my ghost story begins. Marcia Noyes was recruited, even handpicked by Sir William Osler, to become the librarian at the Medical and Chirurgical Faculty of Maryland in 1896, 120 years ago. She knew absolutely nothing about medical librarianship but she ended up developing a comprehensive medical library that served as a resource library until the 1990s, and she learned on the job early evidence of MLA experiential learning. By all accounts, she was extremely competent and well-liked, so much so that when the new MedCai building was opened in 1909, she was given an apartment on top of the building, and it was said to be the first penthouse apartment in Baltimore. She and Dr. Osler remained lifelong friends until his death in 1919, and she remained at MedCai for 50 years until her death in 1946, another synchronistic moment 70 years ago. And even though I'm a resident of Baltimore and knowledgeable about MedCai, I had forgotten about Marcia being there. So I reached out to Meg Fielding, who is MedCai's Director of Development, and I arranged a visit. Sadly, the medical library no longer is in existence having been closed for good in 2004. Some of the collection was auctioned off, some of it was taken by members, and the rest remains moldering in stacks with no heat or air conditioning. However, I was assured that Marcia was still there. Staff hear footsteps and computer keys clicking when alone in the building. If they're looking for something that's lost or something they need, things mysteriously appear. They, they believe in her ghost, although I will say that they are a little less respectful of her than we might be. They decorate her digital image with costumes for different holidays. <sighs> Bunny ears on Marsha, really? No wonder she haunts them. <laughs> so after a tour where I actually saw Marsha's once lovely apartment that's now converted to offices, I jokingly said to Ms. Fielding that using the prism of today's society, one might wonder if Osler and Noyes were more than friends. As I entered my car, I looked back at Medkai, found her apartment on top of the building, and a giant plop of water landed on my head. <laughs> it was not raining, and there was nothing above me. Marcia may have been being playful, or perhaps cautioning me about being impertinent. Regardless, I believe. I discovered that she was buried at Greenmount Cemetery, which is an old cemetery in Baltimore where John Wilkes Booth is buried along with other various Baltimore luminaries, famous and infamous. And I contacted the cemetery to learn the location of her grave. 
A few weeks ago, I visited her grave and left a bouquet to make amends for my impertinence. It is said she loved flowers. And for the past few years, Med Kai has actually sent a bouquet to our Noise Award winner. Call me crazy, but I had an internal conversation with her, letting her know just how important she was and how far the Medical Library Association had grown and thrived. I wanted to be right with Marsha. But why was she our first woman non-physician president? She was eager to learn, eager to serve, instilled loyalty in her employees and her colleagues. Her first employer in Baltimore at the Enoch Pratt Free Library recommended her to Osler as being a woman of executive talents. She believed in professionalizing medical librarianship and she had a passion for that. Googling leadership qualities leads to a plethora of entries that one could pursue forever. So I turned to the library literature where I found information for the new members roundtable of the American Library Association. They have a comprehensive listing of leadership characteristics falling into seven categories. Physical, emotional, social, intellectual intelligence, communication, experience, and trustworthiness. And while they do blur some of the lines between leadership and management, they break down each category further. And we would recognize many of the terms they include as being standard to the current leadership literature. Terms such as agility, vision, risk-taking, self-awareness are touted as attributes for library leaders today. Could those leadership attributes, attributes be found in our past leaders? All of us are probably familiar with MLA's oral histories. And if you are not, then you need to go back and read the Barbara Epstein's 2015 Janet Doe lecture in their own words, Oral Histories of, Medical, of the Medical Library Association's Past Presidents, which appeared in the January 2016 JMLA. However, you may not be aware that for over five decades, the JMLA, formerly the BMLA, the Bulletin of the Medical Library Association, has included presidential profiles to introduce you to the new presidents. So, inspired by Mark Funk's 2012 Doe Lecture, where by analyzing the textual trends in our literature, he somehow compared the quantity of our output to the height of the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, still think it's smoke and mirrors, I decided to try a text analysis. And while my text analysis project of presidential profiles smacks more of Wiz Khalifa than Burj Khalifa, it did yield some interesting results, but it was really hard to do a graphic with Wiz Khalifa in all our words, so I, I decided not to do it. The text analysis software was applied to approximately 58 presidential profiles, including recent profiles and ones further back. These profiles contain 64,373 words, and of those words, 7,640 were unique. I deleted 176 unique common words, which accounted for 37,000 usages, things like a and the. We use those a lot. Um, and so there were 37,000, or I'm sorry, about 27,000 words left to um, analyze. There were still 7,464 unique words left. However, fully 3,888 of them were only used once. Initially, the results were quite discouraging, as not many of the used, most used words in the profiles were ones associated with leadership traits. Shouldn't our presidential profiles focus on leadership attributes? There were instances when current key leadership attributes, such as agility or innovation, were mentioned, but maybe only once or twice. It's also important to note that these are, not, these are word occurrences and are not in context or in relation to other words. Clearly, something had to be done. So by combining similar terms and attributes, patterns started to develop and occurrences grew. The combinational categories were the playing nice with others category, where I used uh, about 10 terms, including things like cooperation, collegiality, collaboration, and they were combined for about 45 occurrences in all those words. Second, I looked at the management words. Um, 22 terms were combined for 56 occurrences, and we used things like practical, effective, efficient, that kind of thing. And then we had the innovation traits. 20 terms combined for 75 occurrences, things like vision, agility, innovation. And my, one of my favorites were the personal traits, humor, energy, stamina, passion. 51 terms were combined for 212 occurrences. Other areas that scored fairly well were mentoring, which had 44 occurrences, ethics, 20 occurrences, and politics, 18 occurrences. But I need to put this all in perspective for you. The term MJ scored 25 times, and TUI 
scored 40 times for an overall combinational score of 65, putting me somewhere between innovation and management. Yes. It was kind of like Googling myself. I couldn't resist. <laughs> So in leaving this exercise behind, there were many attributes that resonated with today's leadership language, such as vision, cooperation, practicality, passion, humor, and MJ Tui. So while endlessly fascinating, but incredibly time consuming, this was not the most illuminating way to assess the leadership attributes of our past leaders. I'd like to make one observation regarding the presidential profiles, and that after reading older ones and comparing them to more recent ones, the older ones tended to focus more on their professional accomplishments, while the more recent profiles tell stories about the presidents including families, pets, favorite pastimes, influential relatives, hobbies, and oh yes, those pesky professional accomplishments. My interpretation is the presidential profiles serve to humanize our leaders, introducing them to members who may not know them, rather than focusing on their leadership capabilities. And since the analysis of mostly dead presidents and their profiles wasn't exactly satisfactory, the next step in the journey was to contact the living. Approaching the immediate past 25 years of MLA presidents was a joy, and with an incredible response rate and a generosity of response. Seven questions were sent to each former MLA president who served over the past 25 years. Two of the former presidents are deceased, but 18 former presidents responded very generously for a response rate of just over 78%. And here I have the listing of the questions that I asked them. So question one, what was your path to MLA leadership? Overwhelmingly, 100% of the attendees or the interviewees questioned reflected experiential leadership in sections, chapters, on committees, or in task forces. Question two, what leadership qualities did you bring to the MLA presidency? Many said they brought organizational skills, a knowledge of the profession, vision, enthusiasm, communication skills, partnering skills, passion for and belief in what MLA does. Question three, while president, what was your greatest leadership challenge? Well, a large number of them responded that budget and financial issues were their greatest leadership challenges. Some were impatient with the slowness of progress, and some reflected on unforeseen challenges, such as the loss and closure of hospital libraries, or illness, or Hurricane Katrina, or the anthrax scare. Question four, what was the greatest lesson you learned? That members are our greatest asset. Keep dreaming, be selfless, be compassionate. Politics are everywhere. Remember to thank people, be flexible, be opportunistic, and take risks. And then finally, that they could actually do this thing called the presidency. Question five, have the leadership qualities needed for the MLA presidency changed? Foundationally, they said no, but the things have sped up. Social media has accelerated the way we need to react and communicate. Presidents need to be advocates and be able to forcefully articulate and advocate our vision. They need to be fearless. They need to have courage. They need to be creative. They need to be flexible. They need to be inventive and they need to be politically savvy and have the ability to create consensus and build partnerships. By now, I had softened them up for the big question. Would their responses be significantly, difficult, significantly different from those who dis, that I discovered in the presidential profiles? Question six, what's the single most important trait for a leader to have? Just snuck it in there. The ability to see the big picture, to have communication skills across technologies and interpersonally to listen and to be fully present, and to have compassion, and to remember that everyone comes to the table with assets, and to be fully appreciative of the blessing of leadership. Look broadly at the world around you and investigate trends. Have integrity and have passion for the profession. Question seven, anything else they wanted to add? You have to have that in there as the last question. And of those who responded, almost 100% reflected a thankfulness for the opportunity to have been an MLA president. Common leadership words that emerged from former presidents compared with the presidential profile analysis were concepts such as passion, of course, having vision, and then articulating and advocating for our shared vision, having integrity, having great communication skills, valuing partnerships and collaboration, but new terms included fearlessness, courage, creativity, flexibility, inventiveness, and political savviness. These newer terms modernized and expanded on many of the traits found in the presidential profile analysis and they're evolutionary in nature. 
they may be very well reflective of the area in which we live. And of course, the great personal access I had to these former MLA presidents. The next step in the leadership trait exploration journey was more granular and involved engaging the current presidential leadership triumvirate plus one in conversation. Following that conversation, I then repeated a study I had done almost 10 years ago with the board of directors. The presidential triumvirate included past President Linda Walton, President Michelle Kraft, and President-elect Theresa Knott, plus one more, the president-elect-elect, the heir and a spare, Barbara Epstein. <laughs> Remember, this was during my time of trying to be nice to her, so I wanted to make her feel included. There were no awkward pauses with this group. This wide-ranging discussion explored a number of issues. Their own particular strengths as leaders was one area we explored. Passion for the profession, there it is again, came up again and again, along with an interest in people, engaging them, talking to them, learning from them, and sharing with them. And when asked what qualities an MLA president needed, they responded to wear armor. I said, this is not a leadership quality, and MLA is not Game of Thrones. So that response became not to take things personally. Presidents need to, have their, to, need to leave their egos at the door. Know that sometimes their ideas are not the best ideas. Be collaborative and approachable, and try to understand issues from a variety of perspectives. That's empathy. To be a consensus builder, to be a risk taker. Acknowledge the absurdity and ridiculousness of situations. Have fun. Have courage. Their conversation gave real substance to some of the traits that I had identified in the presidential profiles and by the former presidents. Interestingly, their comments were very similar to the types of skills the literature says leaders will need in the future, but more on that later. Their comments continued to move the leadership journey further down the road. The evolution of presidential traits seemed to show a need for connectivity to the membership and beyond. Interpersonal qualities have evolved to take on more importance. In 1996-97, as past president, I chaired the MLA nominating committee. In order to give some guidance to the committee, I surveyed the board at the time regarding leadership qualities that presidents should have. I thought, well, they're the ones who work with the president. They would be good folks to ask what they think a president should be like. In 1997, this is what the board said were the key attributes for the president. And you can see the comparison. They need to be visionary with the ability to build shared vision and consensus among disparate communities. They need to be good communicators, articulate, and an, artic and an, and an articulator of vision have be a good listener and practitioner of two-way communication. They need to have broad background and knowledge of MLA and professional issues affecting members and our environment and have the ability to represent our association and profession to others. They need to have the ability to motivate, persuade, inspire, and mobilize individual commitment. They need to encourage collaboration, enthusiasm and energy with physical and emotional stamina. They need to have respect for colleagues throughout the association with a connection with all members and in many different ways, appropriate to the need and to the audience, not just with their type or within their comfort zone. And they need to have an interest in active engagement. They need to be open to new ideas. They need to have political agility and awareness, humility, comfort and grace in the spotlight. And finally, a passion for the profession. Hmm. In 2016, this is what the board members had to say. The president needs to be a good communicator, including being virtually savvy and being a good listener. They need to be visionary. They need to have interpersonal skills. They need to be self-confident. They need to be approachable. They need to have enthusiasm, energy, and stamina. Stamina kept coming up, too. That was interesting. They need to be calm under pressure, trustworthy, respectful, patient, humble, good sense of humor, no doubt. Organizational and problem-solving skills, past leadership experience, and a passion for MLA. With 10 years between surveys, the top responses, albeit in different order of phrasing, were very similar, as you can see. A good communicator, a visionary, a consensus builder, politically savvy, someone who is emotionally intelligent and sensitive to and respectful of all MLA members. Stamina, humor, and humility. And let's not forget about being passionate for our profession. So it's tempting to say here that we expect our leaders to walk on water. However, are these leadership attributes any different than what was already discovered among all the leaders I reviewed? The attributes of past presidents, the presidential triumvirate plus one, and the board members align well with the attributes from the text analysis of the presidential profiles, with, of course, new attributes being added in for our time. 
Would it surprise you to know that there was one more conversation I had? This consisted of, this is the stamina part, you keep talking to people. This consisted of talking to the current and former executive directors of MLA, Kevin Baliozian and Carla Funk. Their outside but inside perspective on leadership added nuances to the leadership qualities of MLA presidents. And here is what I learned from them with this question. What were the leadership attributes of the most successful MLA presidents? They felt the most successful MLA leaders they knew were cheerleaders. They were facilitators. They weren't ego-driven. They were humble. They encouraged different viewpoints. They engaged the members. They were inclusive. They were someone who, although they saw the big picture, knew the work that had to be done. So also, please note, and I think this is important because we hear this a lot in our profession, that with the exception of one comment from a former president who said it didn't matter, not one person commented on the desirability of being an extrovert or an introvert. There's plenty in the literature regarding pros and cons of those personality traits in leaders. And entire leadership lectures could be delivered on those topics. I would like us going forward to consider the term ambivert. And this is a person, it's a, it's a, it's a term, search it. A person who exhibits qualities of both extroversion and introversion as is needed in the situation. Increasingly, this term is actually being used in the leadership literature as a desirable leadership trait. So at this point, we have a fairly good uniform picture of what MLA leaders across our distant and near history have identified as critical leadership traits. In summary analysis, many traits are similar. The more contemporary responses are in line and reflect personal attributes, very common to the current leadership literature. Leadership treat, traits with a healthy dose of management thrown in, focusing on self-awareness, people skills, and emotional intelligence. I surmise if we had the opportunity to survey or converse with Marsha Noyes, and I may have that opportunity, as she appears as a ghost, or other of our past leaders who don't have oral histories, we would discover further alignment and very much some similarities. But all we have are presidential profiles, letters, minutes, and perhaps an oral history to reveal these qualities. And so, after 64,373 words and 58 profiles, 23 past presidential surveys, conversations with current presidents and past and current executive directors, and two board surveys, what did I learn? Our enduring leadership traits are exemplary communication skills in all ways in all directions, vision, collaboration, and consensus building skills. Our presidents, our heroes need to have energy, stamina, humility, and my personal favorite, a sense of humor and they need to provide a sound foundation for our association. And the greatest commonality, as you can guess, overwhelmingly, a passion for our profession. We need to love what we do. Let us shift the perspective a bit and take a look at what this means, not only for leaders in our association and for our profession, but to us personally. What does the literature say will be the critical attributes of future leaders? As our professional home, what is MLA's responsibility and what is our own personal responsibility to ensure that we are preparing engaged, successful leaders, not only for our libraries, whatever that means or whatever they become, but for institutions in a landscape where change is constant and pervasive. It's not enough to look at the changes in the health sciences and healthcare because our future leaders are gonna to need to be called upon to navigate changes in technology, higher education, our communities, in the emerging disease and globalization areas using their skills to connect and bridge knowledge and information chasms. In a society where information is ubiquitous, constant, and accessible, what will be our role? What will our leaders look like? What will all of you look like? What traits will you need to grow and mature in new roles we haven't even imagined yet? Many of the traits such as agility, self-awareness, good communication skills in all forms and formats, vision and passion, we've already identified, and according to the literature, they will remain relevant. What are some additional traits to be considered? We need to consider risk-taking. And although this was mentioned several times, risk-taking, although not a re leadership quality, is a process. Risk-takers pour over details and they study situations. They know the challenges and the objectives inherent in taking a risk. We must become com comfortable with that process. We need to have an innovative mindset. We need to look at opportunities in new and different ways, finding new solutions and perhaps taking some of those risks. We need to embrace, accept, and cause disruption. 
Disruption simply creates a new normal. And in order to embrace disruption, leaders need to pursue the truth, be willing to guide others through chaos, make decisions. They break the rules and they write new ones. But they always have an explanation of why they did it. They thrive on uncertainty. We need to develop a tolerance for failure. Failure doesn't mean you're done. It just means you need to reassess and recalculate. You may fall down seven times, but you need to get up eight. Resilience. Andrew Zoli, who was one of our keynote speaker, speakers a few, year back, few years back, wrote in his book entitled Resilience, Why Things Bounce Back, that resilience is the capacity of a system, an enterprise, or a person to maintain its core purpose and integrity in the face of a dramatically changed circumstance. We need to be empathic. We need to be able to understand another's viewpoint and to actually put themselves in their shoes and, and in that situation. And please know that is not sympathy. We need to develop support networks. We need to have mentors, colleagues, and buddies. I call them frolics, who are my friend colleagues. So I'm hoping that goes into the literature. <laughs> Warren Bennis believed that leaders are made, not born. He compared leadership to a performance where leaders must inhabit their roles as actors do not only learning to see themselves as others see them, but also through a process of self-discovery. In 2009, he said that the process of becoming a leader is similar, if not identical, to becoming a fully integrated human being. How does MLA light that spark and support risk takers, innovators, disruptors, failures, empaths, and frolics? How do we cultivate and grow and encourage leaders, as Bennis said, to inhabit those leadership roles? Throughout my years as a member of MLA, there's been an increasing commitment to leadership development. This seemed to begin in the mid-1990s, maybe late 1990s, as MLA leadership realized that probably within a decade or two, a lot of members would begin retiring. New methods of communication and information sharing required new ways to look at leadership. It became easier to collaborate and share ideas, the internet, email, and electronic JMLA, the rise of consumerism, and exposure to new ideas, and the increasing ability to engage members changed the leadership paradigm from one of our leader being the all-knowing head of MLA to one of chief collaborator, mentor, and servant leader. MLA's strong continuing education program has supported courses, webinars, and symposia on leadership. In May of 2002, there was actually a symposium entitled Leadership Reconsidered, developing a strategic agenda for leadership in health sciences libraries. The following recommendations were made, that they need to offer, needed to offer CE courses on leadership. They need to have scholarships for educational opportunities to develop leaders, to host a leadership institute, to support a chat room for the discussion of leadership issues. There's an old word, chat room, okay. Classes or CE opportunities on political skills in whatever format is appropriate. They needed to encourage chapter and section leadership opportunities, a journal club on leadership, and perhaps provide pathfinders of resources related to leadership. And pretty much many of those recommendations from 2002 have come to fruition. Our already strong CE program now includes at least four courses in leadership. There's a move towards developing a webinar series focused specifically on leadership traits and needs. And I'm particularly excited about an educational initiative called the Nexus Project, which is being funded by the Institute for Museum and Library Services which will be available, I believe, in 2017. Carol Jenkins, a longtime leader in our profession and an advocate for leadership development, and Carla Funk, our former MLA executive director, are part of the development team. This project addresses six different levels of leadership, leading of self, leading others, leading the department, leading multiple departments, leading the organization, and leading the profession. Within each level, there are daily challenges and different things that need to be done. And when it's ready, it promises to stimulate much discussion. Now, MLA's awards program recognizes leaders in hospital libraries, researchers, young leaders, experienced leaders. The Estelle Broadman Award for Academic Medical Librarian of the Year honors an academic librarian at mid-career. And winning the award in 1997 was an affirmation of the work I was doing and the path I had chosen. It was an incentive to keep going with MLA. Once, long time ago, I jokingly mentioned to Carla Funk that if I ever got to do the Doe lecture, dun dun da, that's the foreshadowing music, my presentation would be Broadman Award winners. Did they live up to their potential? 
Needless to say, after a scathing, withering look from Carla and an OMJ, I dropped that idea. See what bullet you dodged? Thanks, Carla. But I have continued to wonder about the effect of winning the award on recipients. And again, would it surprise you to know that I surveyed former Broadman Award winners <laughs> and asked that very question? Hey, when you're the Doe Lecture, you have access to a lot of stuff. There have been 25 winners since it was established in 1988. Two award winners are deceased, and many are retired. Some have left the profession entirely. Within the 14 responses I received, which was a 61% response rate, most responded in the same way. It had been an honor. It reinforced connections to MLA. Most stayed involved, and most continued their leadership journeys right into retirement. But some did articulate the pressure to live up to the award and the expectations of their professional performance. Bart Reagan, scoundrel, the 2012 Broadman Wardy and I have been discussing how the Broadman Award winner might, Broadman Award winners might work together to pay it forward, so to speak, and to support the development of mid-career librarians. As a group of people who have been acknowledged as mid-career academic librarians with potential, whether we lived up to it or not, how can the Broadmans leverage our experience and support not only academic librarians, but all library colleagues who need to lead from the middle? How do we encourage advancement for those who aspire to come, become directors? And how do we engage those whose strength, talent, and passion is leadership in the middle? We have a Facebook page now. It's called the Broadman page. And it's open to everyone, and we'd love to hear any ideas. A small group of us is actually meeting here today at MLA to start discussing what we can do to move forward. So does being involved in leadership programs, winning an award, or taking a leadership course make a person a leader? Of course not. But it provides opportunities for exploration, for self-awareness, for determining your leadership passions, and examining your own personal leadership journey. And most of all, your passion for leadership. Being a leader is not for the faint of heart. It takes courage. But perhaps the most valuable leadership development tool MLA has in its arsenal are its 21 sections, 25 SIGs, 13 chapters, and lots of committees and task forces. As a firm believer in experiential leadership, there is no substitute for the experience of doing. Leadership needs to be nurtured and cultivated, and our chapters, sections, committees, and task forces are our personal incubator. Sometimes the situation actually creates the leader. What would Winston Churchill be without World War II, or FDR without the Great Depression? MLA actually has a leadership and management section, which was actually the medical school library section until the early 2000s, when the section leaders very smartly realized that there was an important need to encourage leadership development. Remember that 100%, 100% of the most recent 25 years of MLA president respondents gain their leadership experience through sections, chapters, committees, or task forces. MLA must continue to find ways to leverage leadership experience within these valuable leadership training grounds. And while it's not a section, a chapter, a committee, or a task force, the Rising Stars program, where aspiring leaders are selected and assigned to an MLA-based project, is a great example of the way MLA itself is actually providing a leadership experience. Leadership in context, hmm, similar to an informationist. A leadernist. Ah, I joke. And I would say to those of you who are leaders or were leaders, your work is not done. You must continue to engage with our emerging and aspirational leaders as mentors and coaches. In the five practices of exemplary leadership by James Cousas and Barry Posner, they ask that leaders do five things. They ask them to model the way, inspire a shared vision, challenge the process, enable others to act, and encourage the heart. It is encouraging the heart that draws me towards the end of this 2016 Janet Doe lecture. This is probably what I'll spend the least amount of time on, but is perhaps of most importance to me. And it is where I want to leave us today. And that is with the concept of the small, lowercase leadership, the small l leadership. I viewed over two dozen TED Talks in preparation for today. By far, the most inspiring TED Talk I viewed was one by Drew Dudley, a leadership educator who gave his talk right here in 2010 at a Toronto TEDx experience. And it was entitled Everyday Leadership. And I would ask all of you to think about this, and I will quote Drew, and it's a fairly long quote. 
How many of you are uncomfortable with calling yourself leaders? We don't let ourselves take credit for it. We treat it as if it's something someday we may deserve, and it continues. And I've come to realize that we have made leadership into something bigger than us. We've made it into something beyond us. We've made it about changing the world. And we've taken this title of leader, and we treat it as something that we someday may deserve. But to give it to ourselves right now means a level of arrogance or cockiness that we are not comfortable with. I believe his point is that we need to get over that. We need to value the impact we have on each other's lives, and we need to redefine leadership because, and I continue to quote Drew, we've made leadership about changing the world, and there is no world. There's only six billion understandings of it, and if you change one person's understanding of it, one person's understanding of what they're capable of, one person's understanding of how much people care about them, one person's understanding of how powerful an agent for change they can be in this world, you've changed the whole thing. And if we can understand leadership that way, we can redefine leadership like that, I think we can change everything. So let's try an exercise. You've been sitting for a long time, and I appreciate that. And I'm going to ask you to stand. How many of you have ever been Janet Doe lecturers, won the Marsha Noyes Award? Actually, sit now and then stand if I call your name. I'm sorry. Not good direction on my part. See, this is why I'm not a teacher. You know, I don't know when I'm going to do these things. OK, let's try. I say, so how many of you have ever been Janet Doe lecturers, won the Marsha C. Noyes Award, or any other MLA award? Stand up. OK, very good. How many of you have served as president or on the board of directors? More standing? OK. How many of you have served on an MLA committee or task force? Oh, very good. Very good. It's getting bigger. How many of you have served as chapter or section officers or on a chapter or section committee? There should be more people standing. How many of you are members of chapters or sections? OK. Here's a trick question. How many of you have ever attended an annual meeting of MLA? <laughs> up, 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 up. Yeah, you have to stand, Kevin. Get up. Look around. Look how many of you there are. Every one of you is here because you have a commitment to your professional, to your profession, and to yourselves. You are leaders. Sit down. <laughs> Otherwise, thank you. Otherwise, it would look like I was co-opting a standing ovation. <laughs> your biggest impact may be something you may never remember doing or saying that leads a change, and that is leadership with a small l. When I've been in leadership positions, I have occasionally been frustrated by people expecting me to do the work, right or wrong, advocate a position, advocate for justice. And what I've come to realize is that people are simply looking for leadership. Most times, that leadership can be found within ourselves. We are all we've got. Kuzis and Posner ask us to inspire the heart. We all have the ability to inspire the heart. And I wish I could give you this next quote in the great Irish-English accent that the poet David White has, when he says, he asks us to find that edge between your own particular signature and genius and what it is being called into by the surrounding world. You change the world by meeting it. You change the world by meeting it. Medical librarianship is in a time of tremendous change, and every one of us is needed now more than ever to lead and grow our profession and our association and ourselves. We need to meet our world. We can't be afraid to lead and start on our leadership journey with that one step. We all can be heroes just for one day, one meeting, one moment, one comment, one conversation, one connection. And if we expect to advance, to thrive, to lead, it is not optional. We must all be heroes. Thank you. much MJ for a wonderful lecture and this session is over. <laughs>